What do you think the chances are that in the next few minutes, what you're going to experience in here can have a significant impact in your life? What do you think the chances are, high or low? Actually, it's very low. Then you might be saying, then why bother? Well, here's the why bother, because it's possible. It's possible that what I'm going to share with you over the next few minutes can have a significant impact in your life. That's what we're going for. We're going for that possibility. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is put blinders on. Get rid of the distractions. It's you and I. And I want you to focus on an area of your life where you're not satisfied with the results you're currently experiencing. This can be your health, having more energy, losing weight. It could be your personal life, improving relationships. It could be your business, your finances. Focus on an area that you're most committed to having some change, and I'm going to help you to do that. Now, I want to ask you three confrontive questions. First question is this. Would you agree that you know what to do, that if you did it, you'd have improvements in those areas of your life that you're committed to? Would you agree that you know what to do? Second confrontive question, most people say yes. Second confrontive question would be, would you agree that not only do you know what you need to do, but secondly, you're capable of doing it? Do I get a yes to that as well? Here's my third most confrontive question. Wouldn't you agree that not only do you know what to do, not only are you capable of doing it, but number three, you're not doing all that you could possibly be doing. To be as successful as you can possibly be in your health, in your business, in your personal life, would you agree with that? Well, it's not your fault. It's not your fault that you're not doing consistently the activities that you need to be doing. Let me tell you why. It has to do with human instincts, the way that you're genetically coded. Let me give you an example of a human instinct. Let's say I puff an air, air puff gun in your eyes. What's your eyelid going to do? It's going to blink, right? Now this time, I want you to intend not to blink. Don't blink. I puff the air puff gun in your eye. What's your eyelid going to do anyway? It's going to blink because that's a human instinct. Remember this, and I'll say this many times. Instincts trump intentions. I want to give you an example of everything that I do is based on science. I'm not going to burden you with the science, but I want to give you an example. There's an experiment where a rat is placed in a V-shaped container with empty alleyways to the right, empty alleyways to the other side. At the end of the right alleyway is uh, food. At the end of the left are rags. And the rat is hungry. We open up the gate. The rat sees what's there and runs up to the right side, gets the food. Now, what we see is the rat is capable of doing what it needs to do to reach its goal. Now, we're going to change something. Take the rat, put it back in the center, close it off. Don't let it eat. Now we're going to put an obstacle in the way. We're going to put a metal grid on the floor separating the rat from the food. So we open up the gates. What does the rat pay attention to? The rat, now the rat, what else that we've done is we put a shock on the metal grid. It's called a shock grid. Now we open the gates. The rat doesn't know that there's a shock in this metal grid. What does the rat pay attention to? It pays attention to its goal. It pays attention to its food. And it starts up to get what it wants to do, what it needs to do to reach its goal, gets this tremendous shock, and instinctively it runs away over to the nice, soft, comfortable rags. Now, I mentioned the word instinctively again, instinct. What happened was there's an instinct in all of life and in you. Remember, blinders on, talking to you one-on-one -on -one about you doing what you need to do, what you know you can do to reach your goals. There's an instinct that all of life have call, that's called the survival mechanism. This is the part of the brain that recognizes danger and compels you to avoid. It overrides your desire to take the action that you're capable of taking because your brain views this activity as dangerous and painful. Let's go back to the rat example. Here's the last thing we do. We put the rat in the center again, close it off. We have not let this rat eat. We remove the shock from the middle grid, but we leave the middle grid. Now, reality versus perception. What's the truth of this time? Is there anything in reality stopping the rat from reaching its goal? The answer is no. We took the shock away. But when we open up the gates, what is the rat in reference to? What does the rat pay attention to? The, when we open up the gates, the rat pays attention to the previous experience of the tremendous shock and instinctively runs away. This is called learned helplessness. The rat will not do what it's capable of doing because of the perception of the previous experience of pain. Human instincts are exactly the same way. Let me give you an example of instincts. Instincts are non-conscious. They're not under your control. Imagine that you're walking in the woods with your friend, and all of a sudden you see a bear. How fast do you need to be? 
most people say faster than their friend, right? Here's what happens. You see the bear instantly, instinctively, you get what's called the fight or flight response. The blood leaves the extremities, goes into the major muscle group, so if you're clawed, you're not gonna bleed to death. You get a shot of endorphins, you get a shot of epinephrine, you get cortisol, digestion stops. You get this physiology so that you can stand there and be as strong as you could possibly be, or you run as fast as you can possibly run as an instinct without any input from yourself. It's all non-conscious. We have instincts because it saves our lives. Everything that is about our genetic coding now is because it favors survival. You know, imagine you look up and a caveman looks up and sees a mountain lion. This caveman says, oh, pretty kitty. You know, that caveman gets killed, doesn't live to pass on the stupid gene. Although some of you watching this I know have family reunions that would dispute that. But anyway, this caveman looks up and has a little subtle difference in his genetic coding. And before he even is aware that this is a threat, this caveman's running 50 yards away, 50 yards gone before he's aware that he's running, retreating from a threat. That kind of subtle difference in the genetic coding favors survival. To be able to recognize a pattern and have your instinct avoid the threat saves our lives. So it's passed down to us. So let me give you an example. Now, this middle grid was the, was the shock. What's the middle grid in the way for you taking the activities you need to take to reach your goals? What's the middle grid? That, what's the pain that you are avoiding? You know, when you look in terms of uh, application towards money, Maybe it's a difficult call that you're avoiding making. But you see, what happens is there's a psychology aspect to this as well. When you're avoiding, the reason you would avoid making this call is because your brain has this call linked to pain, linked to rejection. The number one problem in sales is rejections, call reluctance. Your brain has this link to pain. Now, the human instinct, the survival mechanism, kicks in, overrides your desire to take the action and reach your goal, compels you to avoid. It's not your fault but it is your responsibility. And so let's apply this to, uh, you see somebody, you're, you're at an event, and you see someone you're attracted to. This, this is the perfect person. The way they look, their hair, their clothes, the way they dress, the way they move. And you say, I'm gonna go introduce myself to that person. And you're walking up to do this, and then all of a sudden you take an abrupt left turn and you occupy yourself doing something else. And what happens is you justify this avoidance and you say, well, I, I didn't want to interrupt them or they were busy talking to somebody else. And you justify the avoidance, but the reality of what was going on was that activity was linked to pain. Your brain doesn't censor this. Your brain sees that as a threat, overrides your desire to take the action, compels you to avoid. Let's look at this for uh, health. You know. Everybody's concerned with losing weight and energy. Well, it's not a mystery. What do you need to do to shed that 10 pounds that perhaps now you don't believe you can shed? You need to diet and exercise. What's so difficult about doing that? What happens? Why don't people consistently do this? Because the activity of dieting, think about that metal grid. The activity of dieting is linked to pain. It's linked to deprivation. Your brain views this as a threat to survival. You're compelled to avoid. You justify the avoidance. Getting up and exercising is linked to being inconvenient, uncomfortable, it's linked to pain. Your instinct takes over and you are compelled to avoid. It's not your fault. You know, what lies do you buy into? Where do you accept that you can't do something? Don't buy into that. Listen, I wasn't always an expert in human performance. I had to become an expert by necessity. Let me give you an example. You know, when I was coaching college football, last place I coached was Cal State Fullerton. Cal State Fullerton was last in their conference, their entire existence in the conference, before our coaching staff was brought in. And the problem at Cal State Fullerton is that we just couldn't recruit the better athletes. The better athletes went to USC or UCLA or the Big Ten schools or Pac-12 schools or, you know, they went somewhere else. We got the guys that weren't just quite good enough for the other schools. The reality of it was that every team on our schedule was better than we were. So this is our athletic ability, and this is our opponent's athletic ability. The only way that we're gonna win is to get our athletes to tap into the highest degree of their God-given potential and play at their best and catch our opponents, even though they're better, when they performed at a lower level. And so our task was to find out 
how to get into the minds of a group, get into the minds of a team, and get them to perform peak performance one play at a time. And I'm happy to say that we did this. We figured it out. And the result was we won two conference championships. Some of the people that I coached with have gone on to some great things. Steve Mariucci, you might have heard his name, uh, took these techniques and went on to uh, coach uh, a person by the name of Brett Favre at Green Bay. Brett Favre was unknown. He was discounted from Atlanta. And uh, Steve helped him become an, uh, an all-pro. You know, another person you may know his name, uh, Rich Ellerson, uh, coached with me. We were roommates, in fact, Steve and Rich and I. And he's now the head coach for uh, Army. Take, taking these techniques, getting athletes to perform to the top level of their ability. And so this, I remember a time that we were going to play University of Arizona. And uh, this was really brutal for us. We read in the newspaper, uh, U of A plays Cal State Disneyland, they called us, <laughs> really. And uh, we go to the airport and we see a sign that says, welcome to Wildcat football. Our kids were impressed. And what happened was, in the, th in the fourth quarter, we were leading 16 to 13. We were predicted to be blown out by 40 points. Fourth quarter, 16 to 13, we're leading. We wind up losing, but this was a turning point. This was a turning point when our, when our kids saw what they were capable of doing if they would focus and if they would apply some techniques and if they would tap into the highest level of their ability and they found that it was easy, that they could be the best that they were capable of being using these techniques. And I, I figured out how to do it with teams and how to motivate teams to be their best. And I've been doing this for 30 years. I learned how to do it for myself to get myself to do what I need to do and stop resisting and fighting human nature and reach my goals. And I learned how to do it for you. So remember when we first started, I asked you to put blinders on, get rid of distractions, and to focus in your life on an area that you were committed to have results. You know, I, I, know, it's I know it's tough. And there's so many gurus out there with get rich quick and help you do this and help you do that, and it doesn't work. Maybe you also have tried some of those programs and it hasn't worked for you. I know that, I know. And I'm here to tell you that this, if you think you've tried everything, this is the program for you. Because it's based on laws of science and what we're gonna do is we're gonna implement the same techniques. This, you know, this, I can remember these athletes. They didn't believe themselves, they didn't know what they were capable of doing. And I taught them how to manifest, how to get into their own ability level and bring it out into performance. I taught them how to do that. I became an expert in teaching them how to do that. It wasn't enough. I needed it for myself. I needed to learn how to do that for myself. So 30 years ago, I learned how to do it for myself. And then that wasn't enough because then I needed to learn how to do it for you. And I learned that too. And I'm here to share it with you. I'm going to give you the solution on the next video. At some time, you're going to have to be courageous and make a decision that you're no longer willing to tolerate the result that you have and take an action. Is this that time? There's an email in your inbox with a link to the solution. Look forward to working with you. Let's get started.